The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, inside Larry's Country Diner. Make a loud noise and rejoice. And meet host and radio legend, Larry Black. I think he looked at my math scores <laughs> and he said, you need to consider radio. Take a tour through music history. No rock and roll radio station wanted religion. And the scare that nearly claimed his life. And you're still lying under the ATV. They lost me on the way to Billings. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. The word is out, the Chinese and the Russians have gotten together to agree on a massive disinformation campaign to blame the United States for the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And they're opening up all over the world to bring shame to the United States if they're successful. That is what we're facing. And the question is, what is the United States going to do to answer? We had Senator Cotton on the other day who talked about how terrible the Chinese were, but he stopped short of war. And now we understand that there's a, a move in the Senate to increase the military forces we have in the Far East. Well, opening gyms, bowling alleys, and barber shops. This week, that's the plan of Georgia's governor, despite no two-week decline in coronavirus cases. <laughs> Lindsey Graham says it's going to spill over to South Carolina out of Georgia. Well, 19 other states are also preparing to reopen in the near future. The big question, is it too soon? And what I've got to ask you is, would you want to go to a theater and sit next, sit next to a stranger? Would you want to go to a restaurant and sit right next to uh, four or five people who are uh, in the restaurant? Well, maybe yes, maybe no, but the question is, will we reopen for sure? And now Congress is saying we're going to spend billions more dollars with another round of release in the race against time to save small businesses. But are huge companies like Harvard University and Shake Shack going to get the millions? Are the poor little guys, are they going to get it? Caitlin Burke has that report. With this latest coronavirus stimulus package, lawmakers are hopeful the $484 billion bill will be enough to keep small businesses going. But Republican leaders say it's just a stopgap. Unless we get our economy up and running again, there's not any way we can spend enough to continue to prop up the country. $383 billion of this latest stimulus bill will be earmarked specifically for small business programs, including the Paycheck Protection Program. We want to make sure this money is available to small businesses that need it, people who have invested their entire life savings. The new legislation is on its way to the House after being passed Tuesday by the Senate. Meanwhile, much of the country is working to reopen. 20 states representing 40 percent of the U.S. population have announced that they are making plans and preparations to safely restart their economies in the very near future. Still, some of the states rushing to reopen don't meet the White House guidelines. Georgia's governor is preparing to open gyms, bowling alleys and barber shops this week despite not seeing a two-week decline in COVID-19 cases. When we have more people moving around, we're probably going to have see our cases continue to go up. But we're a lot better prepared for that now than we were over a month ago. I certainly uh, cannot in good conscience say that I agree with his order, and I will continue to use my voice as mayor of Atlanta to ask people to continue to stay home, follow the science, and exercise common sense. CDC Director Robert Redfield warned that a second wave of COVID-19 could coincide with the start of flu season and prove to be even more devastating than what we now face. Dr. Deborah Burke says if there is another wave, the country will be much better prepared. We're going to continue that surveillance from now all the way through the fall to be able to give us that early warning signal. I think what we've learned is how good Americans are about immediately reverting to all of those issues that they need to do in order to ensure that they're protected and their families. Meanwhile, the FDA says it's granted emergency clearance for a new in-home test for COVID-19 
And in the United Kingdom, researchers at Oxford University are beginning human trials on a potential vaccine. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Thanks, Caitlin. In other news, as I mentioned before, Russia, China, and Iran all are working together in a global disinformation campaign to sow distrust about the United States government, blaming it for the COVID-19 crisis. John Jessup has more on this shocking story from our CBN News Bureau. Pat, and as you were talking about at the top of the show, a new report from the State Department shows the three nations are carrying out a coordinated effort sowing false narratives related to the coronavirus outbreak. Russia, China, and Iran are using state media, social media, and government agencies to plant fake stories. Each nation then repeating the other's claims in their own media to reinforce and then spread the stories. One claims the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation created COVID-19 with pharmaceutical companies to profit from the treatment. Another says the U.S. government created the virus as a bioweapon. The report says one of the aims of the campaign is to distract citizens in those nations from their own leaders' poor response to the virus. Well, oil prices dropped again in overnight trading with the United States benchmark West Texas Intermediate falling as low as $10.26 at one point. That came after oil prices closed Tuesday at their lowest levels since February of 1999. But things may be looking a little brighter on Wall Street today, where stock futures were up this morning after the Dow fell 1,300 points Monday and Tuesday. That pullback came after a huge rally, took the Dow up 6,000 points, around 33%, Pat, in just a month. Well, what we don't know is there going to be a V-shaped recovery or a U-shaped recovery. And uh, we were hoping that there would be a V-shape that would hit the bottom and go up very rapidly. And that's what the stock market did the first day or two. But then it just dropped off sharply uh, yesterday. And um, we, we, we don't know what happened. And then the next day, it, it, the next few hours, it comes back again. But um, this, this oil thing is a crisis. And it's not a question of what's happening now. It's like what's down the road. Because the guys won't be drilling. And the crews that work on those oil rigs will be laid off. And then getting those oil uh, fields back pumping and working again may take a while. The United States has led the world in oil. That's the oil export uh, has uh, saved our economy. And now uh, the prices are down below anything that's been seen in decades. And there's a crash. Uh, we had reports uh, yesterday or the day before that oil had gone into a negative territory, so people were having to pay somebody to take their crude. Now they're going to get paid a little bit of money for it, but it's just way, way below the cost of production. They were figuring it would take at least $50, $60 a barrel of oil to break even, and now we're looking at maybe $10 for West Texas Intermediary, uh, Intermediate Crude, which is um, the benchmark we have, and even Brent, which is the international uh, standard for oil has gone down. So uh, wh what, what's going to happen to that industry? But that's just one of many. The food industry is in trouble. All across the board, this thing has hit very hard. And to blame the United States for this disaster, uh, we're asking for terrorists to come to America to do damage to, because we're being blamed for a thing that is destroying the economy of the world. John. Pat, before the coronavirus pandemic, the world was becoming more and more interconnected and globalization was the buzzword. Now, strong borders appear to be making a comeback. And as Dale Hurd reports, some predict the change could be permanent. The map on the left was air travel in Europe one year ago. On the right, air travel now. In the span of just a few months, international travel has been set back more than 100 years. And except for meeting people online, our once interconnected world has largely been disconnected. Could coronavirus kill globalization as we know it? The pandemic has brought back nationalism and borders and could have a long-term impact on the way the world is organized. If we've learned one thing, it's let's do it here, let's build it here, let's make it here. We've got the greatest country in the world. We've got to start bringing our supply chains back. President Trump wants to make America more self-reliant. When coronavirus was raging, some nations got burned when they couldn't get the emergency supplies they needed. 
European Union nations closed their borders with each other like enemies, and in some cases denied help to each other. We are on the verge of a great awakening in terms of what is at stake. Dr. William Maloney of the Centennial Institute believes many eyes have been opened to the dangers of unchecked globalization, which he claims was never the path to global prosperity that it was supposed to be. What happened is that most of the savings from exploiting cheap labor, mostly uh, in Asia, went to corporate headquarters. And the real result was the hollowing out and outright collapse of a wide swath of American manufacturing. Trade expert Simon Lester thinks globalization was mostly good and will return, but in another form. I think that we will return to the same level of interconnectedness, but it might we might be connecting in different ways. Lester also believes the Chinese government faces a reckoning, possibly in the form of economic isolation by some countries, for spreading a deadly virus through lies and cover-ups. Yeah, I think there's going to be uh, an investigation into what happened, and China's going to get a lot of the blame, and there's going to be some degree of economic decoupling. Experts expect more Americans to flee major cities, some of which became dangerous killing zones when the pandemic was raging. And travel industry analyst Henry Hardeveld says the airlines may not be healthy again for a very long time. You'll see fewer airplanes flying than you did before. You may have fewer airlines operating than before. Experts say one worst case scenario is if for some reason coronavirus never completely goes away. And then experts say it will really be a whole new world, and perhaps not a very nice one. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. Back here in America, it looks like most schools will remain closed into late summer and fall. Schools are in phase two of the president's guidelines for reopening the country, but the guidelines also bar gatherings of 50 people or more, and that's a difficult goal for classrooms and crowded hallways. Officials in at least 37 states have ordered or recommended schools stay closed through the end of the school year, affecting more than 55 million students in at least 124,000 private and public schools. While some districts in rural states hope to reopen in May, other states that have been hotspots, Pat, may not reopen even in the fall. Uh, you know, we talk about the damage. Uh, part of the damage is being done to private colleges. Many of the smaller independent colleges are going bankrupt. They can't survive without any students. The students aren't coming. And in those cases, many of the professors are unable to teach online. They, they just aren't equipped to do it. And so they can't give the courses and they don't have the students. And uh, we're looking at a disaster. Again, one phase of the economy is being hurt. I'm pleased to report that Regent University has been the leader. It put out the first online doctorate in the history of America, doctorate in organizational leadership. And that school, because of uh, its pioneering, uh, is doing extremely well, having many students. And uh, we, we have, <laughs> it's going to be a virtual graduation where everything is going to be done electronically, but it'll look, look as if we're all there giving degrees to people. It'll be all the, the usual stuff. And you just did that, right? You got. I, I did it for the individual schools. We used to have commissioning ceremonies, and I did that all virtually. We had the vid wall behind me. It looked like the chapel. And, and you had your gown on. The, and the, 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 everything. The, 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 the what, did that, it, what, what was that like? Well, it, it was fun. It was, you know, I. I each time I said, and now the School of Education, I congratulate the graduates in the School of Business, I congratulate you know, and each one of these things can be put together. And, and wow. the, when it's all finished, the, the graduates will feel like something special. But the actual graduation, again, is going to be online. Uh, it's going to be taped, but it'll be a wonderful production. And having this video that we see behind us, this vid wall, uh, enables us to go everywhere in the world. And mm. so... Uh, Regent University was ahead of the game, but frankly, folks, when you look at each part of the United of the economy, the airlines, the oil industry, the stock market, uh, the uh, food chain, the restaurants, uh, all the things that make up this great land that we're in, they're all being hurt. And education is just one more phase of it. But boy, if there's ever a time that we need to pray for this nation, 
and pray for God's mercy. It's right now. John. Pat, and speaking of graduates and education, thanks to COVID-19, more than 3 million high school seniors will likely miss their end of year celebrations, meaning no proms or graduation ceremonies. CBN senior correspondent Eric Phillips explains why missing out on these traditions can be painful. Some things like high school graduation and prom are seen as rites of passage and accomplishment. Sadly, many of those in the class of 2020 will be stripped of that through no fault of their own. I love school and I, you know, I miss it like so much. I miss seeing my friends. 18 year old Kenya Morris was all smiles on day one of her senior year at Caroline High School in Virginia. Little did she or anyone else know an international crisis would cut it short. She was blindsided by the news in March. I was crying for like at least two hours because in, in the back of my head, I was kind of just like hoping that this isn't true, that this, this is going to go away. It's going to be fine. We're, I'm still going to have a problem. I'm still going to have my graduation. It'll go away by April. It's going to be fine. But then they went, okay, school's canceled for the rest of the year. No problem. No graduation. Sorry. And though this is something that's completely out of our control, it was still like, Dang it. It's bittersweet as she and her family look at her senior portrait and pictures of her trying on her prom dress. Even the cap and gown that arrived in the mail. I wanted my prom to celebrate that, hey, this is my last year here. You've been working so hard for like a little over a decade trying to get to this point and all of a sudden it's just taken from you. Through testing, school officials determined Kenya was developmentally delayed when she was four or five years old. Yet, by the seventh grade, she had worked through it, going on to thrive academically and even becoming president of her high school's National Honor Society chapter. I wanted my graduation to be like, I did it. I did it. Look at this. I did it. I've proven to myself and others I can do it. So can you. I, I hate seeing there their disappointment. That's hard as a mom, as a parent. That's really hard for me. It's disappointing on all sides. My oldest was homeschooled. And so I didn't get to see her walk across the stage. Um, so Kenya was going to be our first one to walk across the stage, get the diploma. And uh, I was so excited. According to Caroline High's website, school officials hope to reschedule both events before the fall. It's a very limited amount of time to get in a prom and a, and a graduation. I hope they can do it. I do. I didn't work this hard for nothing. Though the current situation is disappointing, Kenya is still determined. She plans to attend Virginia Commonwealth University in the fall to study neonatal nursing. Eric Phillips, CBN News. Thanks, Eric. Pat, so many kids missing out on these enduring rites of passage. Well, it's, it's one of those things, but it's better than starving to death. It's better than dying of a, of a virus. So uh, the thing is, they've got food on the table and uh, they've got a family and, and they're still healthy. They, they might not be able to have a graduation where they walk across the stage and get a, a diploma, but um, and they, they can't go to a prom or if that's the Worst of their worries, that's tough luck, but, uh, yeah, you know. I believe God will pay it back somehow. You know, right. he always You're does what, what the enemy means for evil, God means for good, and somehow they're going to be a blessed generation. I, I think so. Well, they'll, they'll learn strength. They'll, they'll yeah. get strength out of this. I mean, it's not, you lose something, but you, you, the Lord gives you something back and it's even better. Amen. All right, you've got something speaking. We of. do. Coming up later, a trip back in time when rock and roll met religion. Scott Ross talks to the iconic radio and TV host, Larry Black, who gave Black, who gave Black one of his big breaks. Well, stay tuned to find out. Plus, it's the coronavirus battle brought on by sheltering in place, out of control food cravings. How do you crush them? Dr. Ian Smith has the answer that's ahead on today's 700 Club. <laughs> Welcome back. You're watching the 700 Club, and we're so glad to have you with us. Skyrocketing mental health issues. That's what America's adolescents and young adults are now facing. It's no coincidence that this generation grew up staring at cell phones. And during the COVID pandemic, the problem is only getting worse. 
Heather Sells explains what parents can do to reduce the impact on their children. Several years ago, we began seeing the number of young Americans with certain mental health disorders jump. This trend of teens and young adults experiencing depression, suicidal thoughts and psychological distress stumped researchers. The economy was doing very well, so that really didn't seem to line up. Um, so I puzzled over this for a really long time. Then Dr. Jean Twenge came across this Pew study and discovered that 2012 became the year that most Americans owned a smartphone. That was when smartphones became common. It's also right around the time that social media went from being optional to mandatory among teens. She has since dubbed this post-millennial generation iGen. iGen was the first generation to spend their entire adolescence with smartphones. And that has impacted how much time they spend with their friends face to face. It's impacted um, their independence. And it looks to be impacting their mental health and happiness as well. Twenge and other researchers studied data on 200,000 kids ages 12 to 17. They found disorders like major depression up by more than 50 percent. The numbers were worse for teenage girls who said they simply felt left out. Their depression rates soared, and so did their suicide rates. I mean, they're agreeing with items like, my life isn't useful. I don't enjoy life. Um, I'm feeling sad or hopeless. One of the problems noted by experts, social media is designed to hook us and keep us coming back, often for hours at a time. Author Caleb Kinchlow says teens are especially vulnerable. This is idea that if I'm not always connected, that I might be missing out on something. Now, the thing about it is they don't know exactly what it is, but they just know that they're missing out on something. In addition to mental health concerns, this iGen doesn't get much actual face time with friends. They're less likely to go out socially, have a driver's license or a paid job. And that's especially true right now as people practice social distancing. Add it all up and you have a generation that has missed key social cues. Always communicating via a text or through a screen, you miss the interpersonal nuances that are imperative to communicating with other people. Something I hear from managers a lot, they'll, they'll say, you know, I like, I like iGen, but I'm surprised at how many will not look me in the eye. And they don't have the social skills that we need them to have for the jobs we're hiring for. While researchers agree mental health problems are up, not all buy into Twenge's conclusions about smartphones, but most agree on some practical measures that can make a difference. A big one, the importance of sleep in keeping mental health problems at bay. That means kids and adults should literally power down well before bedtime. And don't bring the phone to bed because that bright blue light can trick brains into thinking it's still daytime. Also, limit daily use. Most of the research points toward mental health and happiness being the best at around an hour or two of use a day. You get beyond two hours, especially beyond three and four hours a day of use of electronic devices during leisure time, that's when the issues start to show up. If adults can begin to model this good behavior for their kids, especially right now as families are spending even more time together, that could mean better health for all of us. Heather Sell, CBN News. Thanks, Heather. That's the key. Limit your time on social media and your life will be much happier. Well, still ahead, a Wednesday round of questions, your questions and honest answers. Juliet says, I want to know more about guardian angels. How do we invoke or activate our angels to begin to work in our favor? Pat tells it like it is coming up. But first, welcome to Larry's Country Diner. Go behind the scenes with this legendary actor, radio and TV host. How did a brush with death change the course of Larry's life? You're about to find out right after this. Well, each spring, the staff of CBN sets aside a special week of prayer to pray for you, our partners and viewers. From Monday, April 27th through Friday, May 1st, we'll be praying for your needs on the 700 Club. CBN staff will also be individually praying for your requests. If you receive this mailing containing the brochure, Only Believe, 
please send us your prayer requests. If you haven't received it yet, you can still send us your prayer request to CBN's Week of Prayer, CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia. You can also call us at 1-800-700-7000 or visit CBN.com. It is our honor to pray for you. Pat? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a book. This is about Larry Black. And there's a picture of Larry Black in here that he was a partner with Bjorn Borg in tennis. I used to play tennis with Larry, and I thought I could beat him. <laughs> I didn't realize that I was playing against a professional. He was a ringer. But oh, I beat him regularly. And, Seriously? Well, yeah, but I didn't know he played with Borg. I mean, he was a pro. Wow. He was fooling me. He's a great guy, by the way. Disc jockey, actor, TV host. Larry Black has been in the entertainment business, and we had together a group of DJs up at Northeast Radio, Scott Ross, Larry Black, and several others, uh, Andy, um, whatever his name was. Uh, it was a fabulous group, and we had Northeast Radio Network, and Larry was Larry finally decided it was time to write his autobiography, and it is wonderful. So as he sat down with his longtime pal, Scott Ross, shows us some of the best material came when the cameras weren't rolling. And the book is, The Cameras Weren't Always Rolling. You want to get this book. Scott. If you're looking for a down-home meal with all the fixings, you won't find it at Larry's Country Diner. Because what they're serving up are the best country music artists of yesterday and today. This nationally broadcast show is flavored with impromptu dialogue and lots of music. And Larry Black makes sure that every dish comes with a side of scripture. Make a loud noise and rejoice. Psalms 90. <laughs> 98 4. I recently talked with my longtime friend about his autobiography. The cameras weren't always rolling. It's about how God used this preacher's kid from Mobile, Alabama to not only bring together generations of country artists, but also gave them an outlet to share their experiences with Jesus. I really thought maybe I'd be a missionary. There was something intriguing about that. Uh, knew I didn't want to pastor a church. <laughs> knew I didn't want to be a preacher. And the Lord didn't have that for me. Uh, radio is what finally broke through. What was that radio breakthrough? <clears throat> I had a teacher in high school uh, he had been an admiral in the Navy and was teaching algebra. And uh, I had done a halftime show uh, with the band where I narrated what they were doing on field. And the next day in algebra class, he said, you need to consider radio. Hmm. I think he looked at my math scores <laughs> and he said, you need to consider radio. And I'd never thought about that. So after high school, he got married to Lou Ann and took her around the country as he DJed and marketed for a number of secular stations, mostly playing rock and roll. Then in 1969, he felt God calling him back to his Christian roots. Pat Robertson hired him to work for the sales department on my program, The Scott Ross Show. It was the first of its kind radio broadcast that played both contemporary Christian and secular rock and roll. And back then, the government mandated that radio stations had to have a certain amount of religion. Well, no rock and roll radio station wanted religion. Right. But here was an opportunity to write off your religious time right. with a show that played the same music that they played. Later, I handed over the reins to him in 1976, changing the name to The Larry Black Show. He moved his operations to the Music City, Nashville, Tennessee, where he would broadcast in 125 radio stations nationwide. After seven successful years, he got another big break when he landed a gig DJing at Nashville's iconic country music station, WSM. All of the country music stars listen to WSM. So I was on there for two and a half years. They knew me, they knew my family, they knew the kids' names, they knew Luann's name. During this time, Larry also ventured into acting. In the coming years, he played in a number of movies and TV series, such as Ernest Goes to Camp, In the Heat of the Night, The Cape, and October Sky. 
He also created the highly successful TV show, Country's Family Reunion, which has been airing for over two decades. Putting 30 of the legacy artists in a room with a live band, shoot it with eight cameras, and let them just laugh and giggle for two days. And you're talking about country artists that were well known. Yeah, well, my perspective on it was, it doesn't really matter who the person was. Mm -hmm. If they did something that was honorable and to be honored, then you honored that. Then in 2009, he introduced Larry's Country Diner. I said, I'll just do a, an hour show, but I don't want to sit with a fireplace in between me and the artist or a table between, you know, I wanted to do it something different. But all that almost came to an end on June 18, 2015. An ATV accident in the mountains of Montana left him and his friend Randy Little badly injured. But Larry knew God was in control. A helicopter was flying over right at that time. They saw it happen. They were a medical helicopter from Cody, Wyoming. They landed, they picked him up, and life flighted him to Billings, Montana. And you're still lying under the ATV? Yeah. Larry had a broken back and punctured lungs. There were multiple injuries, internal injuries, and uh, they cut me out. When they, when they lifted the ATV off of me, that's when I went south. And uh, they lost me on the way to Billings. They thought you were dead. Yeah. Randy was released from the hospital after three days, but Larry still had a long way to go. So I spent the next six days in ICU in Billings at St. Vincent Hospital and the next 33 days in the hospital. I uh, couldn't move. Uh, one of my other sponsors uh, sent a, a Lear jet up with a medical team to pick Luann and I up and fly us home. And at that, kind of at that moment, it was like, all right, readjust your life. That included making God the focus on special episodes of country's family reunion. He called them the Wednesday night prayer meeting and another Wednesday night. No matter what you're doing, there's a light that shines. And everybody in here today is shining that light. Yeah. Through these and other stories in his autobiography, Larry wants to be clear that in the successes and struggles, God was always there. And Luann said, Larry, you need to do it for your grandkids, right. the 10 grandkids, so they'll know the way you've come. And I've, I've said in the book, God has no grandkids. Yeah. He's got sons and daughters. Hmm. He does not have grandchildren. And my desire for them is to know the God that I know yeah. and to serve Him. Hmm. So that was the main reason for putting it all down while I could still remember most of it. <laughs> He's a great guy. We had a lot of fun. And those guys in Northeast Radio, uh, those mountains rocked. I mean, with Larry Black and Scott Ross, some of the most talented DJs in the country were going out together. And Larry's book is called The Cameras Weren't Always Rolling. It's a fun book by a guy named Larry Black. I guess you can get it wherever books are sold if they're selling books these days during the corona thing. Yes, what an amazing life. I'd love to meet him. Maybe when uh, this coronavirus is over, we can actually have him in studio. Yeah, he can come and he's, he's a dear friend, but he almost died. I mean, God, God's got his hand on this man, but we, we, they, they were just tremendous up there at the Northeast Radios. As I say, some of the most, and we, we did you know, the Scott Ross show and then Larry was producing it. And then the next thing you know, he was hosting it. and. You know, it became the Larry Black Show, but it, you've it done, was... You've, you've done everything, Pat. You started in radio, and then TV, businesses, but it's always been about Jesus. Always about Jesus. But that, that thing, you know, I, I was in South America, and I was praying, God, I want you to reach the youth of America. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, you fired the man who I, I sent to re youth, do the youth of America. So I got back home. I said, Scott, we're going to do a show called the Scott Ross Show, and we, it was, I think, maybe two, three, four hours, and we went in to rock and roll stations on a Sunday and, and had that time with wow. Scott, and then Larry became, was the producer of it, and then Larry took it over. But we had uh, several hundred uh, uh, ro big rockers, big stations, and the audience was enormous for the Scott Ross Show. We had a lot of fun, but anyhow, that's Larry Black, you don't want to miss this book. you got to read it. Cameras weren't always rolling. Okay, I've right. pitched it enough, Larry. <laughs> if you don't sell something, something's wrong. Okay. Yeah. Right. So we've got some questions for you. Ready, right. Pat? 
All right, Juliet says, I want to know more about our guardian angels. How do we invoke or activate our angels to begin to work in our favor? I'm supposed to answer that now? Yeah, and can you do that? Are we allowed okay. to invoke well, angels? We're, first of all, we're not supposed to worship angels. It's a sin. Uh, you know, the angels, but, uh, you know, we used to be when I would, we would do a telephone, we would say, God, send the angels. And the guardian angels would come and protect us because they are spirits. They're sent to look after the, the heirs of salvation. So, but the worst thing, don't start praying to angels. That's the sin. But the aid to say, God, send the angels, send the angels, I think is an appropriate prayer. Okay. All right. Here's Daniel. He says, hi, Pat. I, I am in my 40s. I, I am HIV positive. I have done a lot of horrible things in my life. I have gone to the altar and repented, but I still feel convicted. I still feel like I haven't been forgiven. What do I need to do? Well, you got to start by trusting God. God said, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us your sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, you've confessed your sins and God's forgiven you. I guess the HIV stuff came about from Lifestyle. some homosexuality. I don't know where you, where you got it, but uh, that stuff, I, I think, is incurable. I don't know the medical. What's the, they've got medicine now that is effective to control it. I think it can go into remission or, you know, it can, it yeah, can stop well, it Whatever advance. it is. But the, forget your medical stuff. The thing is, God forgives you. You have repented. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Take that and live with it, all right? All right, good word. Bruce says, hello, Pat. Love you and the show. Being home during the outbreak, my wife and I are eating more meals at home. Today we had tomato soup and grilled cheese sandwiches. I had that yesterday, too. Tell me, why in the world do they put high fructose corn syrup in soup? I'm 69, disabled, and a little overweight. And, Pat, he's right. Even in the Healthy Choice Campbell's they, tomato soup, they have high fructose corn syrup. It's in everything, folks. Uh, it, it was terrible. It, it's... Uh, it's one of those political deals. The, the, the people who live in the corn states want to sell all the corn they can, and high fructose corn syrup is into everything. But um, I, I do believe Progresso, if I'm not mistaken, the thing that I was concerned about was MSG, which was so har harmful. And, and Progresso doesn't have MSG, and I think of all the soups, they probably are better. So if not, I mean, make your own soup, for heaven's sakes. I mean, you know, get some tomatoes and stir them up and put a few things along with it, a few onions and what have you, and you make your own soup, okay? All righty. Here's Keone. How can I go to heaven? People say to me, put your trust in Jesus and repent, but I don't know how to do that. Uh, we talk about that all the time. Uh, you come to the Lord. You say, Lord, I, I was going in a particular direction, and I changed the way uh, I'm going, and I have an afterthought. And I'm now going to go the other way. I repent. I'm sorry for what I've done. But you've got to meet it in your heart. You know, you don't just, um, you know, the Bible talks about those that set a, a stumbling block in front of their eyes. You know, Jesus said, not those that say, Lord, Lord, are going to enter, but those who do the will of my Father in heaven. How can you know that you're doing it? By keeping his commandments and living for him. And how do you know it? Well, the Lord will come to you if you sincerely, you, you start, you repent, you say, I'm sorry. And now you change your way and you sincerely do it. You, you give up what it is you're holding on to uh, because there must be something in there, whether it's greed or whether it's slander or what it is that you've got going in your life, or whether it's lust or you name it, whatever those things are, alcohol, but you've got to be willing to give it up. I prayed with a guy once. He was a drunk. And uh, he came to me. He says, oh, Patty, he said, I've just got so much trouble. I've got to have help. And I said, okay. He said, I, I need the Lord. I said, okay. He said, I want you to pray with me. And he said, okay. And I said, now, here, you pray with the words I say. He said, I'll do it. I said, now, Lord Jesus. He said, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. He said, I'm a sinner. And I, I said, he said, I, I, I'm sorry for the life I've lived. And he said, I'm sorry for the life I've lived. And I know you died for my sins. And he said, I know you died for my sins. And, he, and then I said, and from this moment on, I will no longer touch alcohol. And he said, no, wait a minute, Patty, we're going too far. <laughs> he, 
he said that, honestly. <laughs> so he wasn't ready. <laughs> he wasn't ready. So you, that's what you're asking me. Give your heart to the Lord and believe what he has to say. Okay, that's it. Great story. All right, well, still to come, tips to keep you from binge eating on chips and a battle plan to boost your immune system. Dr. Ian Smith talks about mind over weight. That's coming up. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. President Trump has ordered the Navy to destroy Iranian vessels interfering with their mission. Iranian gunboats have been harassing U.S. ships in the Persian Gulf. Also today, Iran's Revolutionary Guard is claiming it launched a military satellite. According to the paramilitary group, the two-stage satellite took off from Iran's central desert, but no more details in the announcement on its website. The launch comes amid tensions with the United States over Tehran's collapsing nuclear deal and after a U.S. drone strike killed Iranian General Qassam Soleimani in January. Iran has suffered several failed satellite launches in recent months. Well, one Ohio neighborhood is coming together to create a sense of routine for school kids forced to stay home during the outbreak. Every morning, families in Kettering, Ohio, just outside of Dayton, step out to the end of their driveways to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. I think it brings the neighborhood together when we're supposed to be apart. Brings us together safely from a distance, but yeah. it just kind of promotes, you know, unity. And it for the kids, I think it's good to have some sort of structure to their day and normalcy. And that structure is what kicks off each school day for the neighborhood kids. After they say the pledge, they all go back to their homes to complete their schoolwork. Not a bad way to start the day. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Countless Americans have been sheltering in place due to COVID-19, whether it's cabin fever or simply being close to the kitchen 24-7, people are stress eating to cope. How can we resist those unhealthy food cravings? Dr. Ian Smith says it's a matter of mind over weight. Take a look. Well known for his many books on healthy dining, Dr. Ian Smith has approached the topic once again, this time from a completely new angle. The physician and fitness enthusiast believes that most diet plans leave out a critical factor, the six inches between our ears. Like what diet you choose, like what program you want, and your mind is right, then the plan works. Dr. Smith explains the psychological aspects of motivation, goal setting, and cravings in his new book, Mind Over Weight. Readers will learn how to make wise plans for healthy weight loss. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Dr. Ian Smith, joining us by Skype. And many of us, hi there, Dr. Ian. Good to see you. You too. Well, many of us are home all day. How can we resist reaching for that bag of chips or cookies? Well, what people have to understand is that cravings are actually temporary. They're transient. They only last about 15 to 20 minutes they're actually mediated by something called dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter in your brain. And when, you're, when you see something or you taste something that you like, your body floods your, your brain with dopamine, and that makes you want to go answer that craving by getting food. So the trick is, and in the book, I take you through different exercises about how you can avoid giving into that craving, or if you are going to give into that craving, then you should try to eat foods that are less processed and have less calories. Yeah, I definitely have a sweet tooth. What, what are some healthy alternatives for those sweet cravings? Well, I love chocolate. Dark chocolate is amazing. It has tons of antioxidants, which fight those free radicals. Also things like dates. Um, dates are wonderful because they are full of fiber and they actually uh, lower your inflammatory markers in your body, which is an indicator of lowering your risk for certain types of diseases. And of course, mixed berries. I mean, how could you argue against mixed berries. You can actually cover them with chocolate full of antioxidants and lots of fiber. I love chocolate and berries together, especially raspberries. And those dates look delicious. Great uh, suggestion there. 
What about salt cravings? You know, a lot of people don't even crave sweets. They want the salty snacks. How, what's a great alternative uh, for that? Yeah, you know, the book talks about, hey, you're craving salty. Try something like sea salt crackers with almond butter and peanut butter full of protein and potassium, by the way, which is very, very good for you. Also, I love this diced watermelon with feta cheese, crumbled feta cheese uh, and some balsamic vinegar full of vitamin A, vitamin C and something called carotenoids, which helps build your vitamin A. And lastly, hey, try some dill pickles. Yes, good old fashioned <laughs> dill pickles. Uh, they're, they're full of vitamin K, which helps your blood to clot properly. Good for your bones, calcium and vitamin A. My sister was telling me yesterday, and I didn't know this, that when she was pregnant, she craved watermelon so bad she had to have it every single day. So there's obviously something good in there that we all need, and that did look delicious. The watermelon and the feta cheese and the balsamic. All right, well, you talk about savory cravings as well. What are savory cravings and what foods will satisfy them? Yeah, one of my favorites, you know, I was in Japan over the summer. Edamame is absolutely fantastic has tons of soy protein, uh, lots of fiber and antioxidants. And then there's a good old fashioned string cheese. I like string cheese because guess what? It's low in calorie calories, it has calcium, vitamin A, and it's a good source of protein. And also, hey, never forget the guac. Guacamole with raw veggies and for dipping. You got folate, which is vitamin B9. Uh, you got vitamin C, vitamin K, and fiber, and vitamins B5 and 6. So guacamole with lots of uh, raw veggies or hummus, which is great also. Great protein, great B, B vitamins. Yeah, I was just going to bring up the hummus, but you did it. All right. Well, during this pandemic, we've heard about people who have strong immune systems faring much better than those who do not. Why is that and how can we boost our immune systems? Uh, well, first of all, let me just say that, you know, trying to boost your immune system during this time is about what you eat and also how you exercise, believe it or not. And so on my Instagram page, I give out free exercise uh, programs for people. Uh, go to at Dr. Ian Smith, spell the doctor out, I-A-N Smith, and hit me up on Instagram. But things like mushrooms, by the way, are phenomenal, full of B vitamins and polysaccharides, which are good for the immune system. Uh, acai berries are wonderful. They have something called anthocyanins, which is another name for antioxidants. Uh, so we like those. Oysters, good old fashioned oysters, <laughs> vitamin C, vitamin A, and zinc. Zinc is great for your immune system. Watermelon, we already talked about, vitamins A and C. Also, wheat germ, vitamins B and E and zinc. Even low-fat yogurt, by the way. Those probiotics are great for your gut, great for your immune system, and also have vitamins D, B12, and B2. And spinach, you know, my wife loves spinach. So folate, vitamins A and C. And hey, don't forget tea. Tea is full of antioxidants. They're called polyphenols and flavonoids. Great, great, great antioxidants. I love sweet potatoes, especially mashed sweet potatoes uh, with a little brown sugar. Uh, so that has, believe it or not, vitamin A and vitamin C, 30% of your daily value of vitamin C in sweet potatoes. And then there's broccoli, right? Believe it or not, we always talk about oranges and vitamin C. Well, one cup of broccoli has as much vitamin C as an orange, so that's really good. And lastly, don't forget the ginger. It's good in almost anything, particularly tea full of antioxidants, and also it's a good anti-inflammatory agent. Dr. Ian, you're going to be so proud of me. In my green smoothie this morning, I had all of that. I had the spinach, the broccoli, the ginger, big chunk, and, the, and an orange, a little cucumber, um, some collagen protein powder. So I, I, I want a gold star. So I want something. Yeah, that's how you do it, you know, and, uh, and I tell people, listen, if you get a copy of Mind Overweight, let's also exercise and eat better. So you can send me an email. I answer my email myself, mindoverweightbook at gmail.com, and I'll send you some responses. All right. I'm going to follow you up with that again one more time. Dr. Ian's book is called Mind Overweight. It's available wherever books are sold. And we appreciate the motivation because we need it right now. God bless you and stay healthy. You too. God bless you. All right, Pat, over to you, the healthiest guy I know. I agree with him, and I might say that I will try to work out every other day, and I hit it pretty hard, and it seems to be effective. And, uh, you know, when you get to be 90, and I'm 90 years old, I think I want to hit it as hard as I can, and I do that. And, uh, Dr. Smith, <clears throat> I'm with you all the way on every one of those things, cause I've, but uh, cravings I don't have anymore. Well, how would you like to see your income trouble in just four years. That's exactly what happened to Henry Kelly, a handyman who was known as Mr. Fix-It. 
How did Henry do it? Take a look. Henry Kelly is a hardworking handyman known as Mr. Fix-It. He runs a business so successful, he doesn't even need to advertise. Four years ago, he says the Lord told him to start a business of his own and to tithe on all the profits. Henry learned about tithing from Pat Robertson and the 700 Club. And that's when I got it, because he made it very simple. And he said, well, if you have a dollar, just give 10 cents. <laughs> you know? I'm like, okay, I can do that. You know. So the Kellys began to tithe on their business income. In just four years, the Kellys' income tripled. Because of the business, and, and then the skills that, that have learned that the Lord has blessed me, as long as I tithe, it, it works. I've learned not to hold back, but to give as much as I can wherever. You have a piece that, because you're being obedient and you're doing what is meant to be done, then you are gonna be cared for. The Kellys have been faithful CBN partners for years. As their income increased, so did their giving to CBN. But CBN is, um, the one ministry that I really trust, if you just tell somebody about the gospel and walk away, it's not going to do something. But if you feed them because they're hungry, you know, if you help them medically, they're going to listen because you showed them you're not just talking. And that's what CBN does. And when you're a giver, there's a joy. The Lord rewards you a hundredfold. It's one of the most satisfying things you could ever do in your life. And I would say, try it. What do you have to lose? Just give it a shot. I buy it. Try it. What have you got to lose? Give and it'll be given to you. Press down. Good measure running over. I'd like to invite you to join the 700 Club. It's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. You can call 1-800-700-7000. You can say you can count on me. I want to help you help the others all around this world. Well, today's Power Minute is from the book of Proverbs. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and He will reward them for what they have done. For Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thank you so much for being with us. And we've got another exciting show. Dr. Nicole Safford joined us to tell us about how she can fix the health system. And a great general is going to be with us, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin. Don't miss it. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.